I'm sorry you guys don't have a text, but this, like, we're so texted out here today. It was, wasn't really one text I could give you, and I didn't have time to prepare multiple texts, so you'll just have to listen to me. to go. We're good? I don't like making promises. However, I think that you will never look at kosher the same. That's what I think. Let's see in an hour. Today's lecture is a continuation of the last lecture. So let me just briefly recap, just very, very quickly, so you understand where today's lecture begins from, because this is a series. In our first lecture in the series, we try to understand why Jewish people are obsessed with food. And it is not just a cultural thing because we went through all of the major events in the book of Genesis, and they are to a fault. Almost every one of them engage with food. Some of them are entirely obsessed with food. And the obvious question we said is, what's up? Why does everything holy, all mitzvahs, all major developments in the gestation of the nascent nation, why does it always revolve around food? And the answer, from a mystical or Kabbalistic perspective was that the world that God created is, to paraphrase and at risk of sounding mundane, filled with little sparks of holiness. And this is because of a great event that preceded the material terrestrial world. Boina Eilum Esum Achrivan, the Medrash says, God created worlds and collapsed them, that there was this many spiritual worlds that preceded this one, and there was fallout. And the fallout of those spiritual worlds, the explosion, meltdown, if you will, resulted in seeds of light being planted throughout the strata of existence. And this is the idea, the notion of a Lurianic term, which has been adopted and perhaps uh, perverted and twisted beyond recognition, something called Tikkun Olam. Tikkun Olam is Lurianic. It's from the Kabbalah of the Arizal. And the Arizal explained that the meaning of worlds being created and collapsed or meltdown was that the spiritual worlds, for reasons that are beyond the purview of the next 30 seconds, could not be sustained in their previous iteration and incarnation. They had to collapse. However, the energy invested in them is now seeded or embedded in the strata of existence. And when we utilize the material, the physical, the ordinary, the mundane for a holy purpose, we redeem those sparks and we return them to their sender. And that makes the world fixed. So God created a broken world and then he hired us. He gave us the job of fixing his broken world. The most profound way you can fix the broken world is by making it a part of you. So when you ingest material and it becomes a part of you and then you in turn serve God, it's not just you serving God. The cow is serving God because you had a steak dinner. The, 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 the fodder or hay, the vegetation that fed the cow was serving God because he fed the cow and the cow fed you. And the minerals, the soil and the water that allowed the vegetation to grow was also serving God. It's very hard for a blade of grass to dava mairev. It's very hard for a cow to give tzedakah. But when the cow is ingested by a human and the cow previously ingested vegetation, which ingested the mineral reality, now everything is serving God. And this is why food is so important. And I'm just, this is a very basic recapping. I encourage you to go back and watch that class if, if, if you're, you're left wanting. The Arizal talks about the Pasuk that is found in Parshas Ekev that says, 
A person does not live only by bread alone, but rather by all the utterances of God's mouth, so to speak. So the Arizal explains that there is this notion that just like a human being is comprised of body and soul, and the body has a soul invested in it, and that's how it's able to function in this world. So, so it is not only with bodies and souls, or with people, but v'chein hoya hadibur sha'amar be'es habriya l'chol dover v'dover. Quoting the Arizal, so it is with all the things that God created, He invested godliness, raw divine energy. And the divine energy that's invested comes in the form of God's speech, which obviously is a euphemism, and it's anthropomorphism. God doesn't have a voice box or, or a tongue or a teeth chas v'shalom. We don't believe in corporeality. Ascribing corporeality to God is actually pure heresy from a Jewish perspective. So what does it mean, speech? It's a euphemism. It's a convention. It's a way of speaking. So just like when I have an idea within my heart or mind and I wanted to share it with you, the vehicle that I'm able to use is my speech. So it is when Hashem wants to convey a spiritual force into this reality, this terrestrial existence, which is able to be touched in a material sense, so that it comes in the form of speech. Well, that speech becomes the soul for the object that's created. And therefore, the Imkain, again, quoting the Arizal, when a person eats food, there is the material component, which nourishes the body of the person. There's also something called an inner life force, a vitality, a divine energy, which is at the same time able to nourish the soul. And that is why when we have a good meal, not only is the body nourished, but the soul is nourished as well. The Alter Rebbe asks a famous question that it would seem we shouldn't have to eat bread or steak because ultimately we also have a Moitzi Pi Hashem. We also have a soul already. So why do I need the soul of, of the vegetation? Why do we need the soul of the mineral or of the cow? Why can't I use the soul I have? And the answer is that whatever starts at a loftier level falls to a lower kind of st stage the metaphor, one of the metaphors that's invoked is if a wall would collapse, the bricks that are furthest away from the foundation are the ones that were the highest. Or if you look at the damage done, the higher it's dropped from, the greater the damage. And so the lower realities of our terrestrial world, the, 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 more, the more mundane, where there's less life and less vitality, that would be ultimately of a higher source. And the only way for us to be able to access that source would be to eat and ingest the food and send the sparks heavenward. Yes, this is a basic recap of an hour and a half. Okay. So uh, this, is, this is where I want to pick up, up, up today's class. And in the, in the words of, of the Alter Rebbe himself, mm -hmm. quoting the Talmud in Masechet Yuma, that, for example, he says, Kegoin Derech Moshal, this is in the seventh chapter of Tanya. He's quoting Masechet Yoma, page 76b. Ha'eichel bisra shmeina de Tura, a person who has a good steak mm -hmm. dinner. Veshoisa yayin mevusam, and he drinks fine wine. So that he has the energy and inspiration then to go and study. He doesn't feel hungry. He doesn't feel faint. He feels inebriated, inspired, satiated. He's got lots of energy. So what happens as Kida Amar Rava, like Rava says in the Gemara, Chamra Verecha Pikhin, that when you have what's called uh, chamra is a, is a terminology which is used for, for uh, to find wine and he has the fragrance, he's able to utilize the various wonderful things that Hashem created, so this makes him wiser it sharpened his mind, and in doing so what happens is, Azai quoting the Alter Rebbe, at that time when you use the material for a holy and a sacred purpose Nizbarer chayus hambosar v'hayayin so the chayus, the vitality that the Arizal referenced, we just read a moment ago, that vitality is nizbarer, is, 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 if you will, it's crystallized, or it's, it's, we're able to remove it, to separate it from the shaft, so that it can be sent heavenward. Now, one of the famous metaphors that's brought down for this process called biru refinement is if you think that gold nuggets grow in the ground, think again. When gold comes out of the ground, it's pretty ugly. It's, it's black, it's dirty, and you have to do a lot of burning. You have to burn a lot of toxins off. And when you finish burning off all the toxins, what's left is pure gold. So it is also the chayas, the vitality that God invested in the material reality, has to be, if you will, burnt off. People talk about burning calories. People talk about digestion. People talk about this idea of taking something and changing form. It turns actually into energy. So when you do that, then the highest and the divine element of vitality 
is oila la Hashem is elevated to God ke oila uchi karban, like an ascent offering, like an offering in the base of Migdash. In the offering in the base of Migdash, we could physically, literally see how something was incinerated by a fire we brought, but that elicited a fire from God. And then it turned into energy. You turned raw materialism, you turned it into pure energy. In the end, nothing was left. There was nothing tangible left. It, it's, it's, it's like a, a euphemism, a, para, a parable for sending it in a plume of smoke heavenward. And that's the idea then of taking the material world, elevating it, using it for a good purpose. And in doing so, we are mitakin olam. We are fixing the broken world that God purposely created. That brings us up to today. So if this is all true, and I believe it is, who cares if it's kosher? So what if it's not kosher? As long as I do something good with it, isn't that good enough? <coughs> What's wrong if I have a cheeseburger and then feel really, really good? Cheeseburger may be delicious. I don't know. I never had them. And it, it may open up new endorphins in my mind. And I'm feeling great. And I can open a, a page of, of Talmud and I can study it where we have the strength not to go and visit the sick people or, 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 or take care of somebody who otherwise would not uh, be happy or satisfied. And I can put a hand around them and make it feel better. And I got the energy from a cheeseburger. Now I just elevated a cheeseburger. That's great. <laughs> you don't like my question? Yeah. How about the pig? How about the pig? Oh, sure. Sure. You can try to answer. So, non-kosher is supposed to damage the soul. That's, that's, in principle, a good answer. I will, of course, ask you three questions. Number one, why? Number two, maybe it's worth it. I mean, after all, somebody's got to elevate the cheeseburger. That poor pig, he never gets elevated. Is there not a godly element in the pig? Did God not create the pig? God doesn't create junk. He created a pig. The pig must be good. Somebody's got to elevate him. Maybe it should be somebody with a big soul. Maybe tzaddikim should eat the pig. Like you have to make an investment, you know. If you want to make money in business, you have to lose money to make money. Why isn't it worth making an investment? And last but not least, who said, who said that eating not kosher damages us? Who said that? So this is what today's class is going to be about. But we're going to talk about this on, on many levels. So I, I thought that the smartest place to begin tonight's class would be the, with the actual scripture itself. And I want, to, I want to just note that when it comes to food, food and utilizing food, and food being a sacred and potentially holy activity, shows up in the earliest biblical text, beginning of human history. The first time in the Bible it says the word vayitzav, and God gave a command, it's talking to Adam, and it's about eating. There are lots of words. The words God saw, God created, God made, God spoke but no commands. Vayitzav is the same Hebrew word that we use for mitzvah. For a mitzvah. So the first time we use the terminology mitzvah ever in human history, the first time God ever gives any kind of command is with regard to food. And as I shared with you in the previous class, the Abar Benel says, this was the prototype of all mitzvahs. Adam was told to eat certain things and not eat certain things, just like we're supposed to do certain mitzvahs. That's the Mach say 248 positive mitzvahs, and Shasa say the 365 negative mitzvahs. That was essentially represented by fruit he should eat and fruit he shouldn't eat. And then as we went through, you know, at every major moment there was food involved. Noah get, comes off the ark, there's a business of food. What you may eat, what you might, may, may not eat. Abraham and Sarah did most of the work over lunch. They, they use food. Isaac has to give blessings, we're using food. Jacob has a miracle, so now we've got certain things we're not going to eat. We didn't even talk about it a lot in, in our previous class, but if you look at the, at, the, at the Shvatim, at both times, good and bad, they're eating. One of the worst things they ever did was sit down to have lunch after selling their brother. One of the most amazing and dramatic things is the family that's reunited and that they drink wine for the first time in 21 years. And they don't even know that the brother actually is with them. It's very dramatic. It's a little, little story there. It's all around food. And the reason they came down to Egypt was, was to get food. And the reason Joseph, the way Joseph tricked them was with food. And the way they ended up going down to Egypt was, again, food, 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 all about food. And then we go out of Egypt. So the first thing we hear about is? <laughs> Vita food. Carbon Pesach. We didn't even leave Egypt yet. We had a carbon Pesach. Matzah, carbon Pesach. We hear about food. 
And then, very strangely, kosher, so it's an important part of Judaism, kosher? Kosher? Where's the first time kosher shows up in the Torah? A whole book of Bereshit, a whole book of Shemot. It doesn't show up till the middle of Leviticus. Vayikra Tzav Shmini. At the end of the third parsha of the third book, we finally get introduced to kosher. Like no mention of kosher. When, the whole, when it came to the food business, we're talking about food, a whole Genesis and a whole Exodus. When it comes to kosher, we're almost halfway through Leviticus before we actually mention kosher. It's, it's, a, it's a verse in the Torah. I'll, I'll share it with you from the source. It's in Leviticus chapter 11. Essentially, up until chapter 11. Please don't read into that. Up until chapter 11 in Leviticus, we're talking about offerings in the temple. And then we talk about the actual making, the building of the temple. And Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron successfully bringing forth the presence of God. And then, tragedy strikes, Aaron's sons come too close, and they're eliminated. So God's presence is amongst them, and on the very same day that God's presence is manifest and actualized, tragically, two people come a little too close. And then there's a dispute with Moshe and Aaron. Did you eat it? Didn't you eat it? Nothing about kosher. Offerings. I should have eaten the offering. I shouldn't have eaten the offering. We're still talking about food, but no kosher. And the last words are, Vayitav be'enav. Aaron explains why certain offerings were not eaten and certain offerings could have been eaten. And Moses says, okay, you're right. This point, Vayidabar Hashem al Moshe ve'al Aaron lemar. God now speaks to Moshe and to Aaron saying, Dabru el b'nei Yisrael. I want you to speak to the children of Israel, Jewish people. Lemar saying, this is the animal that you should eat. from all the animals. Asher al And we go on now to hear about the signs of a kosher animal. We talk about the, the, the cloven hooves, and we talk about the chewing the cud, the animals that ruminate. And then after we talk about animals, then we talk about birds, we talk about birds, we talk about fish, we talk about all the animals we eat. This is the first time ostensibly kosher is mentioned. We don't hear about kosher bread, even though there are kosher bakeries. That's a subject for a different night. What exactly that means, kosher bread? But ostensibly, grain is grain. Grain should be kosher. Vegetation is kosher. Minerals are kosher. Where do you get into issues? Where do you have matter which is sometimes kosher, sometimes not? That's when we get to the animal world. Some animals are kosher. Most animals are not kosher. Most birds are kosher. Some birds aren't kosher. Some fish are. Some fish aren't. And interestingly, when it comes to this mitzvah, it doesn't say it by Yidabar Hashem al Moshe. It doesn't just say God spoke to Moshe. This time it says al Moshe v'al Aaron, Moses and Aaron. And it says Lamer al to tell them, plural. And then it says Dabru, plural. And Rashi says it would be very interesting that in this instance, this was a, a mitzvah that was taught to the Jewish people not only by Moshe, as was usually the case, but rather this was taught by committee. Everybody was made a messenger, an equal messenger. Aaron was a messenger. Aaron's children were messengers. They were all messengers. They all fanned out amongst the Jewish people and they taught everybody the laws of kashrut. And the first laws that we learned really well were the laws of kashrut. In fact, Rabbeinu Yochanan Luria, one of the important commentaries on Rashi says, in this mitzvah we have the first time where a Mishnahic dictum is fulfilled. And the Mishnahic dictum is the beginning of Pirkei Avot, where it says, Ha'amidu Talmidim Harbe. We should have many disciples. In, other, in, in plain English, everybody should teach. But this is a basic Jewish approach. Everybody's a teacher. Everybody's a teacher, everybody's a pupil. Every one of us has a circle of influence, people who know less than us, and we should be teaching them. Every one of us can learn from others. So we should be learning. We should all be learning and teaching. Not, not, none of us is only a taker or only a giver. So this idea first expresses itself with kosher, where Aaron, his children, Moses, they're going around, they're teaching everybody, everybody's learning the laws of kashrut. And by and large, you really have to know the laws of kashrut. I mean, everybody's got to know the laws of kashrut. You don't have to, you know, it's not for rabbis and rebbesins, it's for you want to be a Torah Jew, you have to know the laws of kashrut, you have to know, is it kosher, is it not kosher? This, this is probably amongst the most important laws for any of us to know. Is my kitchen kosher? Am I shopping kosher? I got to know this. Otherwise, I'm probably not. So this is the first time it shows up. And I want to share with you a Medrash Tanchuma. First a Medrash Rabbah, and then we'll go to a Medrash Tanchuma. 
So the Medrash Tanchuma comments on this business of Zotachaya Asher Tochelo. It's the first time we're hearing this animal. You should eat this animal, you shouldn't eat. When God spoke to Adam and Eve, he said, don't eat animals. At least don't kill animals. There's a dispute between Rashi and Tosfos. According to the Tosfos, you're allowed to eat roadkill. A dead animal could have been eaten by Adam and Eve and their children, but they couldn't kill animals. Only Noah is the first one allowed to kill an animal. However, he's warned not to torture animals, not to eat, any, not to eat an animal when he's in a living state. Kill the animal painlessly and quickly, then you can eat him. Now in, Levit- now in Leviticus, in the third cha- portion, chapter 11, we're hearing for the first time about kosher. So the Medrash Rabbah makes a very unusual statement. Medrash Rabbah, Perikid Gimel. Mogen hu l'chol He is a shield for those who seek refuge in him. That, of course, is a, a verse from Proverbs, from Mishlei. Rav Omar, the famous sage Rav taught, Lo nitno ha mitzvot, elo letzaref bahem et habriot. Mitzvot were given so that we could become connected. In other words, who needs the mitzvot? We need the mitzvot. God gives us an opportunity that we should be able to forge a link and a connection with Him. That is to say, I've heard people comment, my God is bigger than a little sticker on a hot dog. My God, my God is not about this kosher symbol or that kosher symbol. I worship a bigger God than that. And why would God care if I ate this or ate that? I mean, God has nothing better to do with his time. Is it really that important what I had for lunch? Isn't it more important that I be nice to other people? Isn't it more important that I be kind and generous, that I be spiritually minded, that I fulfill mitzvot? What's the difference? So I ate something. So, well, so I shouldn't have eaten it. Big deal. People say things like that. But that's because they have a profound misunderstanding of mitzvot. They think that God needs mitzvot. We need mitzvot. God allows us to have a relationship with Him. And the relationship that He allows us to have with Him is through the medium of mitzvot. So when you do a mitzvah, you get to have a relationship with God. If you ignore God's commandment, you're ignoring God. Ignoring God, you lose the opportunity to nurture and cultivate a meaningful and a profound relationship with God. So Rav says, Lo nitna mitzvot habriot. A very important midrashic statement, which Maimonides references time and again. The mitzvot were given to make us better, to perfect us. Dichsiv, how do we know this? Zotachaya asher tochelo. This is the animal you should eat. Says Rav, kol kach loma. Who cares what I eat? <laughs> Who cares what I eat? You know that famous comment people are making? Rav was talking about this 20 centuries ago. Who cares what I eat? Rav says, God cares. God's a shield for those who seek refuge in Him. You want a relationship with God? It has to be on God's terms. If it's on your terms, then you've created the God of your own imagination, and that is essentially idolatry. Where we create a God in our own image. We instead believe that God created us in His image. And because He created us in His image, we have the opportunity to have a relationship with God if we wish to, on God's terms. Incidentally, it's not an elective, it's actually obligatory. God expects us and obligates us to do so, but it's a free country, as they say. We don't believe in Khomeinism. Nobody's going to force you to do anything. If, 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 if you're not doing the right things, I guess I'm not doing a good enough sell job. That's, that's, uh, I'm supposed to inspire you. Nobody's supposed to force you. So, so the job is that we should inspire each other to keep Hashem's mitzvot rather than under duress or force chas v'shalom. But really, this is what God expects of us. This is what God wants of us. So, so God is a shield for those who take refuge. Just, there's some kind of shielding here going on, waiting shielded from something. Not sure what. Doesn't really, Rav doesn't explain this. He just says, God is a shield if you seek refuge. So if you seek refuge in Him, meaning you have a relationship with God in God's terms, then you're shielded from something harmful or something negative. And I'm going to pose that question to you. What is Rav referring to? I should parenthetically note that very often, Midrashic statements are cryptic. Maybe not as cryptic as the Tsar, which is of a similar genre, but still very, very cryptic. Cryptic statements. And you have to really try to delve into the, the, the depth and the profundity behind these seemingly simplistic statements. That seems very simplistic. God is a shield. Well, okay, he's, he's quoting a verse that says it in Proverbs. What does it mean that God is a shield? He's shielding you if you want to seek shelter in Him. How, how, how does kosher shield us? And how, by following His word and seeking shelter in Him, are we shielded? And from what are we shielded? That's, I think, the question I want to put out there. 
So there's a Medrash Tanchuma. And the Medrash Tanchuma on the same, on the same Pasuk says like this. This is the animal you should eat, says the Medrash. Zehu sha'amar hakatuv. This is exactly what King David meant in the book of Psalms when he said, "La'asot ritzoncha elakai chafatzdi." To do your will, God. This is what I want. To do your will. That, that's what I'm looking for. V'toratcha betoch mayai. And your Torah. It's in my kishkes. <laughs> this is what I want. I want to do your will, God. And your Torah is in my kishkas. Your Torah is in my intestines. It's a very strange statement. So the Ba'ir Ha'imrim says, what does that mean? What is the Medrash Tanchuma saying? If, if you talk about Torah study, we're talking about something that's grasped in the mind, perhaps sometimes in the frame of emotional quotients, the EQ, the heart, but certainly not the stomach. You fill your stomach with food, not with ideas. All the ideas in the world will not bring you satiation. And all the food in the world will not make you any smarter. So why do we use that terminology? Vahaloi says the boyer, Ein mishkona ela b'moyach The Torah doesn't sit in your kishkes, it's not in your intestines, in your stomach. It's in your heart, it's in your mind. So he says, Ela hakavona or halachila akshayda. What the Medrash Tanchum is referring to here is kosher food. Where does kosher food go? Hopefully in your stomach. That's... Right? Some of my children feed their clothes also, but I was supposed to actually put the food in our stomach. So the food should go into the stomach. And then what happens? And al yoda, when the kosher food goes into my intestines, tikones chayes l'neshama, then vitality is able to enter my soul, ki ilu hichnes Torah l'meav. It's as if you put Torah, which means instruction and inspiration, into our stomach. In other words, there's some kind of link here between being able to download and ingest holiness, even Torah, and kosher food. That's, that's what the Medrash seems to be saying. So the lesson about the mana. Right. Yes, it's a lesson about mana. <laughs> Let's not go there now. So this is, this is we have two Madrashic statements. So I just want to refresh. Everybody's following along? I brought you a scripture. Noted that doesn't show up to Leviticus. A little strange. I gave, and along with that Pasuk, I quoted for you two different Midrashic sources. Now we're going to go on a little journey, go forward a couple of hundred years, into the time of the Rishonim. And we're going to see how the Rishonim amplified and explained these verses based on the Midrashic teachings that they received, but with the illuminated eyes that they had. They had like night vision goggles. So they had the ability to look at something and magnify the point of light 10,000 times. And the way the Rishonim looked at something was light years ahead of us. And we have the good fortune of having the scripture, the Chazal, the Rishonim, the Achronim. We can look through the whole prism of all of Jewish scholarship as it's been taught generation after generation, continue to be amplified and explained. We're very lucky. In a way, we're very far from Matan Torah. In a way, we are after the accumulation of so much teaching, so much inspiration, so much clarity. So let me first introduce you to Rabbeinu Avadio Sephorno. He's a great Rishon, a Spanish sage. He wrote a commentary on the Chumash and on other things, but I'm going to share with you his commentary on this verse of, on chapter 11, Leviticus chapter 11. He says, in order to understand why kosher doesn't show up until chapter 11, why it's not until after Genesis, after the story of slavery and freedom and the receipt of the Torah, after the story of a golden calf, building of a Mishkan, after the story of everything that had to be done to actualize the Shekhinah, which is exactly where we are right now, before chapter 11. He says, Hine, Achar shehit natzlu Yisrael es ed yom haruchni, when the Jewish people lost their spiritual crowns, or halos, Shekonu b'matan Torah, which they had acquired at the time of the giving of the Torah. So let me give you some background, fill you in. The Talmud tells us that when the Jewish people said, Nase v'nishma, we will obey. And we'll also try to understand. But first, the foundation was, we're going to obey what Hashem says, even if we don't understand it, but we won't remain in the dark. We're going to do our best to try to learn and understand the profundity and depth of Torah so that we actually buy into it and find joy and pleasure and, and, and profundity in it. So when we'd said that, there was, it says, Malachi Hashoras, ministering angels that were dispatched, and they tied crowns to our heads. 
whatever that means. It's not it's euphemistic. It's a spiritual concept. How would you explain a cell phone to somebody who lived 500 years ago? How would you explain it to him 100 years ago? The answer is you wouldn't. <laughs> Why not? Because you would have no language. You have no frame of reference. For us to understand the meaning of that spiritual halo that our ancestors experienced at the foot of Mount Sinai just prior to experiencing mass revelation and God speaking to several million people and each one felt that to be a personal experience is a lot further than a cell phone was from people 700 years ago. We have no language. So we use the best language we can, understanding that these are one of the things that we don't really understand. Just as a person who would be born, born blind could never understand the difference between violet and purple or even yellow and red because they never saw colors in life. They have no frame of reference. A person who was born deaf would never be able to appreciate the beauty of music. You could explain it till you blew in the face. You could write a series of books for Helen Keller. She'd never be able to understand it. Why? No frame of reference. We don't have a frame of reference for this. But this, whatever this meant, there was something very, very profound that happened. And... What happened was, once we got those halos, Asher hoyu ru'uyim lishrot shechina alehem bilti emtsoi. The Jewish people all now got a wireless modem. They did not need to have a device. The device was implanted. Who knows, maybe that's going to be the case in five years. We're all going to be, have iPhones implanted in our head. I don't know. <laughs> I know, scary thought. But point was, on a spiritual level, they were able to download the presence of God without having, they didn't have to be in the area of an antenna. It's like, it's like, think about this. Once upon a time, in order to do a live broadcast such as we're doing now, which is costing us nothing, and people watch all over the world, you needed to have, just a short 20 years ago, at least one tractor trailer full of equipment parked outside, enough cables that looked like uh, monster spaghetti, and, and, and you know, it would cost you $50,000 to do this for an hour. But now, this little tiny iPhone has got the capability that once upon a time you needed a tractor trailer to do. So imagine if you would come to the Jewish people and say, you know, see that big tractor trailer thing called a Mishkan, called a Shul? You don't need it. You have a personal device. It's your halo. That's what it was like. So we, have a, we were fitted with these halos, and we didn't need any medium. We didn't need any convention to be close to God. We were online. We, were all, we, all, we heard the music. We felt the energy. We saw the pictures. We were there. How do we know this? Sephardim says, I'm not just making this up. The scripture says it. Ka'amroi, like it says there, once we got these halos, or these little modems, it says, B'chol ha'mokoi, ma'sher azkir es shmi, in every place you will mention my name, ovoi eilecho verachticha, I'll come to you and bless you. Incidentally, Hasidus explains the word berachticha in, in the permutation of lahavrich, to bring, to draw forth, to actualize. So you come, wherever you are, whoever you are, you don't need a minion, you don't need a shul, you don't need a base amigdash. You just call out to God and you actualize God's presence. That's how it was. And this was a foretaste of the glorious future that will yet come. That's what things are going to be like when Mashiach is here. When Mashiach comes, it's going to, it says, Ayin ba'ayin yiru. We're going to see God eye to eye. I don't know what that means yet. None of us know what it means yet. <laughs> We're going to find out in Metz Hashem. In the way we're looking at each other, when Mashiach will come, that's how we'll know the presence of God. That's how manifest the presence of God will be. Imagine if your eyes could open and you saw the subatomic structure that we're now living within. That'd be mind-boggling. But that, it's going to be a lot more profound. The, the presence of God will be everywhere. And this was the case after they got the Torah. As it says, I will place my Mishkan amongst you. I'll never reject you again. So that, that will be the case. And that was the case. However, unfortunately, what happened was we really dropped the ball in a big way. Some 40 days after having that mass revelation, we were jumping around this dumb calf, a golden calf, Yes, it was moving and doing funny things, big deal. And we said, this is your God who took you out of Egypt. This molten bunch of gold, like, like that all of a sudden somebody turned into a calf that was moving. A magical moving golden calf. Okay, I get it. He took you out of Egypt? It was a lump of gold five minutes ago. So we don't really understand it. The whole idea of idolatry makes no sense to us. And we live in a different age, a different era. We have our own Avedizara today. We have our own challenges. But in those days, that was the big challenge. And they were very smart people, but they were blind when it came to this. And they made this terrible mistake. 
And there's all kinds of explanations. They were seeking a medium. They thought Moses was able to inspire them. They needed some kind of central figure to inspire them, just like the cherubim later. Whatever, all, all the rationalization in the world is not going to make it right. It just helps us understand what they were thinking. At any rate, God expected more from them. And, and it, was a, it, was a, it was a big disaster. And what happens is, we lost the presence of God, as it says, Ki I will no longer be amongst you anymore. So Moshe Rabbeinu goes to bat for us in a very serious way. And Sepharno says, Moshe Rabbeinu is successful to some degree. It never comes back again. We never reach that level of divine consciousness that we had at the time of Matan Torah. That will only happen when Mashiach will come. What we did get was a Mishkan, a mini Beis HaMikdash, and that was Shetishra HaShchina B'Seicham, that the Shechina could be amongst us through the ages of the Mishkan. As it says, V'asu li Mikdash, you built for me a sanctuary, and the words in the scripture are, V'shachanti, and I dwell. What should it say? There's one Mishkan. So in Hebrew, if you're talking about one thing, if you build a Mikdash, V'asu li Mikdash, V'shachanti, I will dwell. It should say, B'tocho, in it. Instead, it says, B'tocham, in them. Who's them? Says the Shalah and other, 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 other great uh, uh, Torah teachers that it means it means within each and every one. So the Mishkan becomes the vehicle through which we're each able to have that download. Okay, so let's use uh, another like, a metaphor just to make it easy. Every once in a while you're driving around there you see like a flagpole that's for some reason about six times as thick as an ordinary flagpole. Do you ever notice those? There's one on the bath, there's one on Young. Yeah, those are really towers. <laughs> That's your cell phone tower. It, I'm not so sure if it's healthy to live next to it, and they don't, they're not sure either, by the way. So they figure if they put a flag on it, you're going to be too stupid to notice that it's six times as thick as a regular flagpole. You'll think it's just a, th a thick flagpole, and you won't notice that you're living in the middle of some kind of vortex of 60 billion gigabytes that are flying back and forth. But at any rate, what happens if those towers go down? What happens to this little iPhone over here? Chalas, it's finished. This iPhone is not as powerful as he thinks he is. He's only powerful because he's attached to a bigger operating system. It's like the electric grid. We all have electricity in our homes, Baruch Hashem. We're all functioning in a wonderful way. Why? Because there's a massive grid in place. What happens if something will go wrong with the grid? It did, like 10, 15 years ago. You remember that? Everything goes dark. So the Mishkan becomes the power station. And then who becomes an extension of the power station? Every single member of Amiso. So through the Mishkan, and now we need a Mishkan. The Sepharno follows the approach. There's three opinions about the Mishkan. Whether God commanded before, whether God did not command until after, whether it was not even supposed to be a Mishkan originally. The Kuzari says, there was never supposed to be a Mishkan. He says, Mishkan? Pfft, what does that mean? God dwells here and not there? That makes no sense. So the Kuzari says, you know when the Mishkan idea was introduced? Only after the golden calf. Because the people basically said, we need something to hold on to. We need something to rally around. Can't just be all spiritual for us. God said, fine, then make a Mishkan. But, but don't get obsessed with the Mishkan as Isaiah railed against people who brought offerings and lived miserable lives. Lives that were full of unholiness and selfishness. He said, sure, you have a Mishkan, sure, you have offerings, but it's like becoming a mensch, being a spiritually minded, sensitive, compassionate, loving and generous person. That's what it really is all about. But the Mishkan becomes the, 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 cent the central power agency through which each and every one of us is able to download the holiness. So, so far, we're, we're not up to chapter 11 yet. You see what the Sepharno did? Okay, he just, so far, he just explained to us what's been happening from the middle of Exodus all the way to the middle of Leviticus. And when, and when did this happen, he says? In the ninth chapter. It says, Vayera kvayd Hashem el kol ha'am. The presence of God became visible, manifest to the whole nation. And then, in the next verse, Yeridat ha'esh min ha'shamayim. A fire descended, as it were, from heaven. Then we had a little disaster in between. But then comes chapter 11. Ubecheni says, Ro letakin mizgam. God wanted us to have a proper equilibrium. Muchan laor, baor hachayim anitzchim. We should be a ready recipient. We should be an appropriate vessel to receive the presence of God. And what do we have to do to become an appropriate vessel to receive the presence of God? 
This comes when you're careful about what you eat. So if you eat kosher, not kosher style, this is not a cultural thing. It doesn't matter if it looks kosher, smells kosher, it tastes kosher. It matters if it is kosher. So if it's authentic Thai cuisine that's kosher, that's great. You can come close to Hashem. If it's wonderful chalant, which is not kosher, it's not kosher. It doesn't matter if it looks Jewish or is culturally Jewish. That's irrelevant. What's relevant for us is tikkun hamazonot. And Hashem says, Oser es ha-macholim ha-metamim es ha-nefesh. God prohibited the foods which would deaden our souls. So every one of our souls is born with millions of little sensories. These little sensitive parts of our soul. What happens is, God forbid, if we eat food which is not kosher, a lot of those nerve endings die off. And becomes, we lose sensitivity. You know, sometimes people get older, they lose sensitivity in their touch. We could lose sensitivity. So we don't respond to holiness the same way. We don't respond to Yiddishkeit the same way. Why? Because we become desensitized. Think of a person who goes off to war, and then he saw all kinds of horrible things. It's the, it's the worst possible reality anybody could ever imagine. A situation of war, Rahman al we, don't, we have no holy wars, by the way. The whole, the, that terminology, holy wars, anthem for a Jew. It's a horrible thing, war. We have moral wars. Wars that have to be fought. But not with joy. With very heavy hearts. We never want to go to war. We pray and hope never to go to war. So, but when you go to war, it takes a toll. It takes a toll. A person is involved in killing. That's what it is. You're in a killing field. You're killing human beings. Your whole soul function is to eliminate human beings. Call it any fancy words you want. You're killing people. They call it eliminating the target. Thank you very much. So it makes you feel better. It's not. It's killing. And you know what? A lot of people come home from battle. They're not the same people anymore. Why? They lost something in the process. Now, truth be told, that's a great sacrifice these young people make. And they, have, they get all the credit in the world for it. But there's a price. There's a price to pay for everything. The doctor, who's a brain surgeon, who routinely cuts open people's skulls, and is fixing their brains and taking off tumors in their brain, he doesn't faint at the sight of blood. And he loses a little bit, he leaves a little bit of his compassion and sensitivity at the door. If he's going to start crying every time he cuts somebody's head open, he's going to be a lousy surgeon. To be a surgeon, he has to become indifferent. It's a price you pay. It's a, it's a very high price, and there's an amazing merit you have in saving lives. But there's a price. Everything's got a price. And so, when it comes to eating not kosher food, I'm sure the food is delicious. But there's a very steep price for that food. And the steep price we pay is that it poisons our soul. And it disables us from becoming vehicles to receive the presence of Hashem. That's what the Sephardim says. So this is what you were alluding to, Jesse, when you said that there's this idea, eating non-kosher food deadens you, but now I'm giving you sources, I'm explaining to you. Now we understand why this doesn't show up until chapter 11, because earlier, up until this point, it seems that this, we, we didn't have to emphasize so much. We didn't have to take such care. We were like on a different level maybe once upon a time. But now, at this point in time, from the post-Mishkan and onward, the only way we can keep our souls in good working order, keep it clean and functioning, is by making sure certain substances are not going to be absorbed. Let me share with you the words of the Ranban, Nachmanides, very famous sage, the leader of Spanish Jewry, during a debate with a Hebrew turned Christian and Pablo Christiani, the Ramban so effectively demolished his arguments that the Ramban had to flee Spain and he was one of the early medieval sages who returned to the land of Israel. Actually led like the first pre-modern Aliyah. Anyway, Ramban, before he went to Israel, he wrote his commentary on Chumash. In, on, in on, uh, Parshas Kitetse, chapter 22 of, of Deuteronomy, there's a long rumination here from Ramban about it's actually, it, it, it's all about sending away the mother bird. That, that's where it begins. But I want to share with you a snippet of the Ramban because it sheds light with regard to the issue at hand. Ramban says, a person might say, Ma what difference does it make ben eichel tares or machalim amutarim lit la eichel tmeyes vehem machalim asurim? What difference does it make? God's bigger than a hot dog. God's bigger than this or that little detail in the kosher supervision. Come on! Talk about a great big God, creator of the universe. Don't get obsessed about little things. And a person may well say, Ramban says, and he's quoting actually a medrash, that it doesn't make a difference. 
Sha'amra Bahem Taira, the Taira said, Tameim Hemalachem, they are Tame for you. Incidentally, Rabbi Shamsul Farhirsh explains that the idea of Tame means sealed. It comes from the word Time in Aramaic, which means bones that are sealed off. There's marrow in the bones, the bones are sealed. When a person becomes Tame, he becomes like sealed off. He's no longer, he's no longer a, a vessel, a vehicle. He loses that sensitivity. Like the nerve endings are dead. He's sealed, sealed off, like a person whose heart is sealed. So the Rambam, Ramban says, this is a remez. This is really not about the health of the body, he says. This is about the health of the soul, to have a clean soul. And he says, the sages explain to us, the, the Torah explains to us, and the sages elucidated and explained, that in order for us to have a soul that is in good working order, or lezakik is nafshaseinu, to crystallize and purify our souls, we have to avoid the things the Torah tells us to avoid. And that's why the Torah uses the terminology, it says, do not make your souls abominable. And it's talking about shellfish there. And it's talking about animals that are not kosher. About eating creepy crawlers. It means it makes yourself, it seals yourself off. You make yourself unhospitable to holiness. Where holiness doesn't mean anything to you anymore. Like water off a duck's back, but it really shouldn't be that way. Why? Because of the negative influence of the food. Let me share with you the words of the Akedas Yitzchak. Another great Rishon. Then we're going to go to a Barbanel who gives it a little bit of, shall we say, philosophical language. Maybe it's easier for us to understand. So some of the Jewish med- medieval philosophers spoke of, of health. They said there's a possibility that kosher has something to do with a healthy body. And if you have a healthy body, you have a healthy soul. Akedas Yitzchak rejects this idea entirely. And he says, Vaharoi, it's really appropriate Shaneda that you should know. This has nothing to do with bodily health and wellness, or the opposite. That's not why the Torah prohibits Elo Hamacholot. Like some people said, and he uses a very strong word. He says, Chalila. Chalila is a euphemism for like heaven for a friend. Have you heard like people say, Chas Shalom? Chalila. People think it's Yiddish, it's Hebrew. Chalila means it's. How could you make yourself mundane? How could, it comes from the word chol. It's like sacrilege. He said that's a, that's a statement of sacrilege. Chalila. She'im kein. If so, he says, nismata madregas haftari, you have minimized a glorious, grand, divine Torah, and you have made it another textbook, a medicine, medicinal textbook. He says that would be a terrible thing, an act of sacrilege. Vizem miguna. He says, I find this repugnant. It's a disgusting attitude in the Akedas Yitzchak's words. So what is it? Skipping a couple of lines, he says, Amnam, Masha Nesru Lachem, this what the Torah prohibits, Hu Le'inyin Choyle HaNefesh. We speak here of a healthy soul, not a healthy body. So just like a healthy body should be able to run up the stairs and sprint, just like a healthy body is not sneezing and collapsing, it has the strength to be able to do what it's supposed to do, a healthy soul can function in the spiritual reality in a healthy way. A healthy soul can feel what it's supposed to feel, has passion where it should have passion, gets engaged by the things that are supposed to engage it. Just like today, we talk about mental health. We talk about emotional health. A hundred years ago, people laughed at things like that. Post-traumatic stress disorder. Who ever heard of that? Be a man. It don't work like that, dude. Today, we know it doesn't work like that. Today, somebody could have a very healthy body and they could be very, very sick emotionally. So it's not always, it's not always mental illness. It's not always a chemical imbalance. Even that, the, the, the jury's out on still, whether the whole chemical imbalance might be a souped up thing. There are, there are many psychologists who are not even sure that that whole business is actually true. It's just, by the way, Google it, you'll see. It's not, it's not, even, it's not, it's not a, by any stretch of imagination a fact. It's hypothetical. It's hypotheses. We seem to have many things that prove it, and then a lot of people doesn't work for us. So, oh, well, if it works 51%, that must be it's clinically proven already. How come it didn't work? It did work 49%? It's, it's not simple at all. But for sure, everybody could agree that it's something called a lack of emotional health. A person, God said, they could be lonely. A person could be heartbroken. A person could be depressed. It's, 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 there are various reasons why this could happen. And there are ways to heal people. Sometimes the way to heal is, is, is relationships and friends. And sometimes the very things that inhibit people emotionally, they collapse and give in to these feelings. And in doing so, they get sicker. So, so this, there, there are things to do. Not, psychology is not only about pharmacology. 
The therapist, therapist will, will work with you, will help you with your emotions. You got a phobia, you got an issue, work with your issue. There's methodologies that are proven to work. We know there's something called emotional health. We know there's something called mental health, even if we don't know exactly what it is. Big mystery the brain tells us. There's something called spiritual health. It's healthy. It's spiritually healthy. Then when Rosh Hashanah comes, a yid becomes excited. He hears the shofar, the sound of the shofar, it makes him tremble. It's unhealthy when a person hears the sound of the shofar and it sounds like a squeaky door. It means nothing to him. He sees the kotel and he's like indifferent to it. Or sees the kotel and something touches inside him. There's a healthy soul and an unhealthy soul. I could go on. You know what I'm saying. So how do you have a healthy soul? You have a healthy body. You have to keep it in good working order. You take care of your body, your body's healthy. You don't take care of your body, chas v'shalom, it's not. The soul you have to take care of. How do you keep your soul in good working order? He says we have to avoid, first and foremost, these foods which necessarily damage the soul. Now let's put that in the frame of the Arizal, through the lens of the, what the Arizal said. Every food, he says, has a, has a chumri, it has a material element, and it has a godly element. It's, excuse me, it's nourishing us or affecting us on many levels. So in that case, he says, some of this food is actually going to darken your soul. It's going to be mazikim, it's going to injure and harm the soul. And it's melidim boy ha'atimus. It, it births or causes a sense of being sealed off, non-responsive, indifference. And that's why he says we use the word tamay for a food which is not kosher. So it's not tamay. Tamay is ritual impurity. There's two different sets of halachot. There's the laws of ritual impurity and laws of food which is kosher. Why do we keep mixing up the language? He says, I'll tell you why. Because, because they're not mutually exclusive. Halachically, they're mutually exclusive. Philosophically and spiritually speaking, they are very, very kindred. They share much in common. And it's lahorot, a quote from the Ekedi Sitzach, lahorot to show you, kitama asurim, the reason that you're not supposed to eat these things is mitzad ruach atuma, because it will cloak you and envelop you in the spirit of impurity, a ruach ra, a bad spirit, a ruach which will turn you away from Hashem. And that's why he says this is evidenced in a different medrash, which I didn't go into tonight, about uh, medrash Rabbi Tanchuma, about the idea of a sick person, two sick people, where, God, where the doctor says to one sick person, don't eat this food, and the other sick person, you could eat the food. And he says that the Jewish people have a special soul, and we have a special mission, and therefore what may be kosher for other people is not kosher for us. If you go to somebody who is anaphylactic and say, have a peanut chew, he says, are you crazy? I've got to die if I have a peanut chew. Like, I had peanut chews, nothing happened to me. Okay. You don't have a sensitivity for this. But we have a sensitivity towards things. Being Jewish doesn't mean we're smarter, it doesn't mean we're richer, it doesn't mean we're more successful, it doesn't mean any of those things. Jewish, being Jewish is not, is, not, is not a race, it's not a color, it's not, a, it's, not, it's, not, it's not an ethnicity. Being Jewish simply means you have a Jewish soul. And a Jewish soul means that on a spiritual level, you're able to relate to God in a unique way. And in order for you to be able to experience that unique relationship, you need to keep that unique soul in working order. And certain foods will harm it and damage it greatly. So now we have all this like spiritual language from the different Rishonim. And I want to end with the words of the Prince of Spanish Jewry, Don Yitzchak Abarbanel. The Abarbanel, all of the commentaries incidentally are on Parsha Shmini with the exception of the Ramban that was in Deuteronomy. The Abarbanel says like this. He says, what's up with these different signs, kosher signs? Animals who, have, who chew their cud or don't chew their cud. So Abarbanel says, you know why animals chew their cud? You know why? <laughs> it's because they don't have two sets of teeth. The teeth, they don't have top teeth and bottom teeth. So he says, the, 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 the chompers don't do the job. So in order for them to actually absorb the food, in order for it to become... Uh, if you will, ground down into, the, into a fine paste that the animal should actually be able to absorb it, what has to happen? It chews, chews a little, then it sends it back into the first stomach, and the enzymes attack it, and it gets punched and zetsed around, and then it gets sent back for another chewing. And that happens a couple of times. He says, animals like that cannot eat other animals. There's no way they can ingest another animal. What do animals like that eat? Vegetation, plants. They can only eat plants. And so Abarbanel says, the point here is that because Sibas Aloy Sageda, the reason that animals ruminate or throw back the cud, chew the cud, Sha'in La Toichanis, Belechia Elyon, because they don't have teeth on the upper molars, would you call it that? 
Yes? Anybody know? A dentist over here? A vet, actually. Anyway, the upper teeth they don't have. The upper jaw. ma'achala. So in order for them to grind the food down. Bavur says, says the Abarbanel, Lotucha lechol at They can't eat bones. They don't eat flesh. Raka sovin. They only eat grasses. And he says, what happens is, they, they're, they're able to actually swallow them whole, and then it becomes softened, and then they chew it a little and swallow them whole. And eventually, between the entire process, it gets ground into the matter that the animal can assimilate into its body until it can digest it. And he says, because of this, we are dealing with non-predatory animals. We're dealing with animals that have a more refined quality about them. And because those animals have a more refined quality about them, here he alludes to the idea which is talked about very much by the Sefer by the Achinuch and by the Rambam and Mor Nevuchim, as well as Ramban and other places, this idea of you are what you eat. And the wild animals eaten will necessarily give you wild characteristics. It will turn you into a predatory, mean creature. And therefore, he says, that's an example of the sensitivity or lack thereof that we're dealing with and how it could impact the soul in a negative way. Okay, we're going to get to the Shach thing. We'll get to that. Let, let, let's stick to the substance now, okay? Not, not the process. Okay, now, having arrived here, so now I would like to introduce you. Now we'll go back to our big question. Maybe it's still worth the, uh, the investment. I mean, somebody's got to elevate the pig. Maybe it should be some commando Jews who learn so much Torah, do so many mitzvahs, that they are certain they're not going to be brought down and they're going to be able to elevate the pig nonetheless. So let me quote to you from the book of Tanya. And this is found in the seventh chapter. These, the words that the Alter Rebbe shares, this is the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov, which are rooted in the Kabbalah of the Arizal. And he says like this. In the beginning of chapter seven, he speaks about utilizing material, mundane, ordinary things for a holy, sacred purpose, thus extrapolating the sparks and sending them back home, elevating the world or fixing the world. The Rebbe says, and I want, before I go further, up until now, one could argue that sure, there are sparks in even these bad things too. The non-kosher animals also have godly sparks. However, however, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt you. It's, it's the too steep a price to pay. Who will elevate them? I don't know, not me. I don't want to do that because... <laughs> then I lose the presence of Hashem in my life. That wouldn't be a good idea. But in theory, up until now, from learning the Chazal and the Rishonim, it seems we need to be protected from this. The Chazal speak about shielding us, protecting us, allowing for God's presence and God's Torah to be able to flood our existence, to permeate our core and our being. We talked about the danger or the, the damage that's done from eating something non-kosher. The Alter Rebbe says that the truth is, it goes beyond that. When you're dealing with macholas asuris, he says, macholas asuris are what's called asur. What does asur mean? It means prohibited, right? But you know what else it means? It means tied down. They're chained. You know, you know how you call somebody who's in prison? Asir. Why? Because he's tethered. He's tied down. So because he's tied down, he can't get out. He's not free. The Alter Rebbe, in this chapter, in the chapters of Tanya that precede this, explains the Lurianic idea of something called klipa. Klipa, freely translated, means appeal. Klipat egozim, that's the shells of a nut. Klipat banana, that's the shell of your banana. You like bananas? All right. You eat the shell, you eat the peel when you eat a banana? No. You only eat the inside, right? Me too. So when you buy bananas at no frills, you buy them with the sh peels or without the peels? And then what do you do with the peel? Away. Understand, so why did you buy a peel to throw it away? Suppose we would have a go into no frills and there's a pile of bananas without peels. Do you think anybody would buy them? What do you think? They, they'd probably go bad very quickly. It'd be a rotten, stinking pile of bananas. So we buy bananas with peels and then we throw out the peels. So what's the purpose of the peel? It protects the inside. So there isn't really value that's intrinsic to the peel, but the peel is necessary. Why is the peel necessary? Because I want the fruit. And the only way the fruit's going to be protected is if I have the peel. Well, that's how it is kind of with creation, my friends. 
God created a world which would be a place in which we could facilitate the presence of Hashem. And how do we make the presence of Hashem appear? How do we make God's presence manifest? By doing mitzvahs. By doing mitzvahs. What's the most important thing you need to be able to do a mitzvah? What, 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 what would disable you from doing a mitzvah? Huh? having the possibility not to do a mitzvah. In other words, if it was not possible for you not to do the mitzvah, the mitzvah would have no value. Because then it would just be an instinctual thing. It's not a mitzvah to breathe. Why is it not a mitzvah to breathe? Because that's what we do. It's intuitive. A normal person breathes. It's an avera maybe not to breathe. If you suffocate yourself, that's a sin. But a mitzvah, it's not a mitzvah to breathe. It's normal. It's something you do. If mitzvahs were something that came naturally or easily, would we get credit for them? As the Mishnah says, Lefum tsara, agra. According to the pain, comes the reward or the gain. What, why, God has to torture us? He says, if you work really hard, I'll give you more reward. Come on, God, just make it easy for me. But the truth is, it's the price you pay that makes it so valuable and meaningful. When you get something for free, you don't really care. You don't care, you got it for free. When you work really hard for it, you earned it, it's mine. Incidentally, human nature is that we value things we worked hard for. And things we didn't work hard for, there's a term for it in Torah. It's called Nama de Chisufa, which means bread of shame. Being on welfare is not a healthy state of being. It's not healthy. It's not healthy for a human being to get handouts. What's healthy is for a human being to work, to earn his own bread to make an effort to achieve something. We're born to achieve. We're not born to be a loser and just receive for free. It's the most unhealthy thing you could do to a person is take away the possibility for him to achieve things. So why did God make such a dark world, a difficult world, a painful world, a challenging world? You know what the simple answer is? Because he loves us. You say, what? All this pain and sorrow and travail and trouble and obstacles because he loves me? Yes! Because otherwise you could never become great. Because you overcome those things, that's how you become great. So in order for God to make a world in which there would be light, what did He have to create? Darkness. darkness. What's, the, what's the spiritual terminology, the Kabbalistic terminology for darkness? Klipa. Klipa means a, a, what's devoid of God's presence. Could it ever really be devoid of God's presence? It wouldn't exist. But it's apparently devoid of God's presence. Klipa can be told Yetzirah, Klipa can be called Satan. Klipa can be called Mita, death. It can be called Malach It has many names. It comes in many shapes and forms. The common denominator, they're all bad. It's the ungodly. And God created the ungodly so that we should be able to find virtue when we choose the godly. Now, in Klipa, there's two kinds of Klipa. There's something called Klipa Nogo, or the shell of light. And then there is shalosh klipot atmeot, the three klipot which are irredeemable or irretrievable. A simple example. How many of you throw out the skin of the chicken when you make chicken? You throw out the skin? Yeah, I never eat the skin, I don't like it. But a lot of people put paprika all over it and they eat the skin. No? You like, you like that. You like, that's okay. So in other words, sometimes we have peels which don't have to be thrown out. If we work hard enough, we can turn them from garbage into something good. Some people like orange peels and chocolate. I never figured that out. But it's, it's like a food out there. Right? They found a way to utilize the peel too. Sometimes you can use the peel as well. Some peels you can't use. Nobody can use eggshells. I never saw anybody bite into an eggshell. It's not, that's just not pleasant. But some peels can be used. So what does that mean? There's difference in some peels, there's peels and there's peels. There's peels which are worthless and peels which could be valuable. Depends what you use them for. Klipas Noga is shell of light. The shell of light means depending on what you do with it. Everything in the material world is full of chumrius. It's full of material, materiality. And because of its material nature, it necessarily is not overtly and apparently godly. However, it can be made godly. How? Eat the steak dinner. Drink the wine. But then come and learn Torah. Or reach out and comfort somebody who's, who needs consolation. You just elevated that. So that which is not inherently holy, just became very holy. It's only one day a year we avoid it, that's Yom Kippur. But otherwise we say, go for it. And right after Yom Kippur, by the way, we go straight into our party, Hat and Sukkah. And we eat and drink to make up for that one day of fasting for seven days. 
that's great and that's beautiful. And the whole idea of a sukkah means an ordinary dwelling place which can be rarefied and elevated and made holy. But then there's things which they can't be elevated. Why? Because they're connected to the shalosh klipas atmeis. So because of that, what happens is, if there's a food which God says, don't eat this, and you say, you know what, God? I think I am going to eat it. God says, I told you not to. Don't do it. So when you eat it, what did you just do? You rebelled against God. What happens now? So actually what happens now is, instead of elevating the sparks, you demote the sparks. You see, pigskin is actually just fine, as long as you don't eat it. If you have a pigskin football, and you use the football for everybody to have recreation, or the kids are entertained, or whatever else is which is healthy and even holy, the pig actually gets elevated. When I was a little boy, there was a sale on shoes somewhere. We lived in Philadelphia. And um, my parents took me there, and there was this pair of shoes, and it was, I heard the guy say it was made of pigskin. I was like 10 years old, and I refused <laughs> to buy the shoes. And the father's like, it's beautiful shoes. What's the problem with the shoes? I'm not wearing a pig. I don't care. <laughs> but <laughs> the truth is, whatever. I was like, like a shtick. There's nothing wrong with wearing pigskin shoes. There's nothing wrong with wearing pigskin shoes. Absolutely nothing wrong. And I'll tell you something else. I know people who have issues with their heart and they use a pig valve. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with using a pig valve from a pig's heart. Nothing wrong with it. On the contrary, you save a life. So before the pig was eaten by you, the pig actually had some hope. He could become a football. He could become shoes. He could become a valve. Maybe he would be used by non-Jews and at least they would do good things. And now you ate it. And because you ate it, you took the pig, you robbed the holiness that was there, and you put it in a much lower way. Because as low as it was before you got in contact, now it's much worse. Because of your material involvement, because of the overt chumrius, because of the intense physicality and materiality, which is, by its nature, devoid of overt godliness. So actually, it's like you ma- the, what, that which was prohibited, you made it worse. So just like we said, you can eat and elevate. Not only did you not elevate it by eating it, it's even worse. Because you did use this as an act of rebellion against God. So the poor pig, is, would, if he could talk to you, say, please do not eat me, you idiot. You're, you're rebelling against God with me. Why, why would you do that? This is the pig says, I don't rebel against God. I'm just a nice little pig. I don't bother anybody. You took me and you used me as a way, as a sword against God. What are you doing? That's not what he wanted with this world. So you made things worse. So if you can elevate you can also denigrate. That's the key here. So it's, it's not that it's, well, let's elevate the pig. No, I don't think we can because it'll be too much of a price to pay. You can't elevate him. You can impact him. You can make things worse. You can darken things. You can make things that much worse. Incidentally, there is, of course, a godly element. What happens to that godly element? Well, the at godly element is once you finish with the pig, and once you've demoted it, in Eilu Misham, it's in the darkest abyss, and it cannot be rede- redeemed from there. So you did the opposite of Tikkun Olam. <laughs> Try this emphasize. Tell somebody, when he eats a non-kosher sandwich, he is reversing the process of Tikkun Olam. I think you're crazy. But that's the truth. That's, that's the meaning of these words. Tikkun Olam means, eat the kosher sandwich and then pay a shiva call, or attend a wedding. That's beautiful. You elevated the sandwich. To be... The opposite of Tikkun, to break the world, is to eat the non-kosher sandwich. And then it goes into a dark place, it goes into dark matter, in this black hole, and that black hole, nothing can come out of there. Ad ki yoimam, until its day comes, v'yivula hamavas l'netzach, until death is gone forever. When God removes the possibility of darkness forever. And this, of course, is when Mashiach will come. As it's written, v'esruach hatuma, avir min haaretz, as it says, the Zechariah, the prophet said, that when that time will come, the spirit of impurity will be banished from the earth forever, but that will only come later on. So the damage you did is intense. Then the Alta Rebbe comes along and he says, truth be told, it's even worse than that. Because what happens if a person eats non-kosher food, but they didn't know it was non-kosher? In fact, the mashgiach made a mistake. It's possible. Mashgiach is fallible. He's made a mistake. Or maybe the caterer was unscrupulous. And when the mashgiach looked this way, he did something behind his back. And everybody thought they're eating kosher. And the mashgiach thought it's kosher. But tragically, it was not kosher. What happens then? And then we studied and we did mitzvahs. So we sang and danced and prayed. What happens then? Does the non-kosher, do we do tikkun olam then? Comes the Alter Rebbe in Perek Ches and says, I have a little secret to tell you, he says. When you're dealing about non-kosher foods, 
From what we said before, it shouldn't be called tie down. You tie it down. You're, you, you're, before we explain that your act, because it's an act of rebellion or sedition, you tie the food down. But here we're talking about it's intrinsically tied down. The Alter Rebbe says, you're right, it is intrinsically tied, tied down. And af mi michael iser hoida. You ate the food, unbeknownst to you. You didn't know it was not kosher. And, and you wanted to serve Hashem. And then you went ahead and served Hashem. It doesn't work. Why? Because those sparks can't be elevated. That's the meaning of non-kosher. Kosher style does not help us at all. Either the sparks can be elevated, or they can't be elevated. And these sparks can't be elevated. And some sparks have to be elevated when the object is ignored. That's the elevation. That's the way it's elevated. It's like the guy's going out. He said no to 30 girls until he said yes to the 31st. Because he said yes to the 31st, then he works for the rest of his life on building his marriage. Thank you, Mazel Tov, Yashakoyach, that's great. Part of the yes required 30 no's. But that doesn't mean he should have married 30 women until he finally found his wife. It means he had to reject 30 women, which is nothing personal, that's great to somebody else, not for him. That, that's the way his path to marriage came through dating 30 people until he finally got, came to his path. Or vice versa. However many days she, the, the guys she dated. The point is that to build a relationship, there's only one person you're supposed to have to build that relationship with. And it could be there's many people that you have to say no to in order to get to that yes. In order for us to elevate sparks, there are lots of sparks we have to leave behind. And usually those sparks, they sparkle and shine. And they say, come, come, take me, I look so good. And because they beckon to you. you know, they smell delicious and, it's a, and I'm so hungry. But when we say no, then our relationship with Hashem has begun. Because we, we acknowledge what Hashem asked us to do but furthermore, had we eaten that, we would have denigrated and demoted it. And then had we eaten it, we couldn't have elevated it. It's in prison. It's locked up. You see, that's not fair. It's life. That's the way God created the world. Dark and light. Darkness can't become light until Mashiach comes. Incidentally, when Mashiach will come, it says, Lama nikra shma chazer. Why is it called a chazer? You know what a chazer is, right? A pig. Al shem shetachzer lono. Because the pig will come home to us. When? When Mashiach will come. And the Orah's long Or HaChayim, the Or HaChayim says that all the non-kosher animals eventually become kosher. And when Mashiach will come and all Klippu will be gone, everything can be elevated. That's great. When Mashiach comes. You probably won't be interested in that when Mashiach comes anyway, but when Mashiach comes, everything will be released. But until then, there's going to be lots of darkness. Now comes this question. One second. But the person did good things. He did good things. There was a broken, lonely person. And you were feeling mis really miserable. But you had that, that sandwich and a good coffee and you felt like a mensch. And because you felt good, you were able to talk to this person. You know, that person was going to commit suicide. And because you spent an hour being kind, considerate, and compassionate and empathetic, you saved the person's life. Did the pig not save somebody's life? I mean, you don't have the... You're, before you were just frustrated. Leave me alone, I'm so hungry. And then out of nowhere, you found the sandwich. You ate the sandwich. You felt great. You did a huge mitzvah. You saved a life. What do you mean it didn't get elevated? So this question was actually posed to the Rebbe, to our Rebbe. And the Rebbe writes a letter in response. He says, in response to your question, how is it possible that the, the spirituality didn't get elevated if the person didn't do it as an act of rebellion against Hashem? He thought the sandwich was kosher, he meant well, and he did the mitzvah. So like, what do you want? There was no rebellion, no sedition, he didn't ignore the will of God, he did everything right, and he wanted to do good things, and he did good things. So the Rebbe says, in a word, that your premise is wrong. The Rebbe answers the question. Your premise is that it's a given that the spiritual reality intersects with the material reality. And that it's natural for somebody physically to eat and sparks to get elevated. The Rebbe says, there's nothing natural about that. That's the way God endowed it to be. It's not as if you eat, you get sated. You smoke, you ruin your lungs. No, th those are natural things. But to say that somebody eats kosher food and then does holy things and there's this dance of sparks that are making their way heavenward, that's not a natural thing. That's a godly thing. That's, that's a special segula. That's a special wondrous reality that God attached to the performance of a mitzvah. And the Rebbe says, if it's not something that's kosher, the sparks didn't get elevated. End of story. Sometimes you have to eat the non-kosher food. There was nothing else to eat. That's true. But you still can't elevate those sparks. Why? Because those sparks remain tethered right here below. Rabbi, yes? Does the power of elevation that comes from eating kosher food, is it lost in the absence of reciting the prayer before it? 
That is an excellent question. The question was, is the power of elevating the food lost when you don't recite a bracha over it? The Arizal that we were quoting right in the beginning says exactly that. He says, if you don't say a bracha, you didn't get to elevate the food. Furthermore, the Alter Rebbe says, even if you said a bracha, but you ate gluttonously, and you didn't do it for the right reasons, you also don't elevate it. It's not a given that you elevate sparks. It's not really a thing that makes sense to us. It's a spiritual thing. In order for it to be a spiritual thing, you have to play your role. The only difference is that the dark side can't be retrieved. The shell of light can be retrieved. When you do tshuva, you can turn it around very quickly. The sparks are waiting for you, like an eye cloud. You just have to access it. So when you eat the kosher food, is that a blessing? You can elevate it at a later point. It's waiting in the wings. When you eat the non-kosher food, it can't be elevated. Then it becomes lost. But yes, in principle, in order to do this full elevation, it's got to be kosher. You've got to make the bracha. You have to eat purposefully and meaningfully. And finally, do something good with it. I presume it's not all or nothing. Like there's different levels of... It's never all or nothing. <laughs> so we talk about the utopia. We speak about a paradigm of perfection. And now we'll all try to do something. And if every one of you leaves here tonight looking at kosher just a little bit different, if you understand once and for all why kosher style is the biggest sham that's possible, those words are the greatest oxymoron. There's nothing stylistic about kosher. That kosher is a reality, a godly reality, a reality that is beyond what our minds can actually fathom, but a very profound and powerful reality and an intrinsic part of what's called tikkun olam. If you leave here with that sense, and you be a little bit more careful about the food you eat and how you eat it, then tonight's class will have been a great success. Thank you all for coming.